Well, hey everyone. Welcome to episode 342 of F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Pat Payne. This week, we welcome Eileen Rafferty to the podcast. Eileen is well known for her alternative printmaking classes and her creative approaches to creating photography projects. This week is full of inspiring tidbits of advice and information, so I highly encourage you to stick around for the whole show. Before we get going, I have to thank another fantastic human being for financially supporting the podcast on Patreon, Gene Fain. I was so lucky to meet Gene on a recent photography workshop in Newfoundland, and it was fantastic connecting with her on a much deeper level than just photography. That certainly is one of my favorite parts of teaching, is that it goes well beyond photography and can transcend so many different things. Thanks to everyone who has helped me realize this dream of becoming a full-time photographer. You're amazing. All right, let's get to this week's episode with Eileen Rafferty. All right, Eileen Rafferty, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. I am excited for this one. Uh, As I mentioned, I did a little uh, reach out on our Instagram channel to see what questions people might have. So I think we're going to have fun with this one. Great. Sounds good. Yeah. So for people who aren't familiar with you and your photography and your work, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. It, it's it, kind of hard to know where to start and how much to tell you, because I've honestly been doing photography since I was a teenager. You know, yeah. I was the, I was the, the yearbook photographer and I learned the dark room in high school. And so uh, it's just kind of always been a part of my life. My dad was an amateur. Uh, he was not professional, but he always had a camera, always had a movie camera. And so, you know, I guess that's where where the interest came from. So I live in Missoula, Montana currently, moved out here as most people who come to a town like Missoula thinking you'll stay for two or three years and it's now been almost 20. Uh. (laughs) (laughs) It's a great town. It's got a really big arts community, a really big, you know, photographic community. And so I just sort of settled in and um, really love it here. And I, my career as a photographer is when I officially started working as a professional, probably would have been in my mid twenties. I was living in the DC area and did any kind of freelance that came my way. Uh, and then I was also a custom darkroom printer there for four years, which was a really, really formative, mm. important experience for me. I mean, I worked in the darkroom 40 hours a week, every week for four years, you know, professionally printing and learned so much there. Uh, it was a really great experience. Um, and I went to out to Rocky mountain school of photography for some, there was summer intensive program. And then I went to graduate school down in Richmond for photography and film and, wow. um, and you know, have just, there's just been a lot of manifestations and, and therefore the kind of photography I do has evolved and changed a lot depending on what I'm doing. So yeah, I taught at the Rocky mountain school of photography for like eight years. I've been, you know, university of Montana adjunct professor, other places, adjunct professor, in the last many years have been doing freelance video editing and videography and still doing photography. So I work at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture as their photographer, videographer. I also do my own videography. I do video editing and I do teaching. So yeah, it's the photographer's world, you know, you do right. many, you got, many, many things. <laughs> you got like 50 irons in the fire. Exactly. Yep. yep. That's a necessity for most of mm-hmm. us, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You, as you were talking, you know, you, you have a formal education in photography, which I've I've found that is fairly rare these days. Most of the people I talk to on the podcast, you know, it's self taught or they picked up a camera and got interested in it and maybe mm-hmm. took some workshops or whatever. But I, what I've found is that the people, and maybe this is overgeneralizing, but mm-hmm. the people that have that formal background in photography or education, I, I've found that they have more of a, um, how do I say this? There's more of a artistic approach to the photography in terms of like creating thematic images or images that are about something else. It's not typically like landscape or street like there's mm-hmm. usually like mixed media and so i'm curious you know i'm, I'm guessing that's 
intentional, but I'm curious if that resonates for you and if that's been a part of kind of your approach to photography as well. For sure. Um, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I learned dark room and a little bit of photography in high school. And then when I lived in the DC area, I was taking classes through the Smithsonian Institute, you know, kind of what, what a lot of people do is taking lots of classes. Of course, then it was all in person, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't doing anything online. Um, and so I was really piecing together an education and learning all different types of photography. And then, like I said, came out to Rocky Mountain School of Photography for their summer intensive program, which was really, for me, intended to really get a strong technical foundation in photography because they do a really good job at that. And also, I, I had already gotten my um, undergrad degree in physiology, so yeah. I wasn't going to go back to school undergrad. Um, and so I wanted some hardcore training without going to college. So I went to Wright Mount School of Photography and then moved back to the DC area. And that's when I started working as a darkroom printer and a and freelance photographer. Uh, and I did that for another maybe four or five years. And, and what really prompted me to decide to go to graduate school was um, I did feel like I had sort of reached this ceiling a little bit as far as my technical knowledge was about as awesome for me as it could be, you know, mm -hmm. obviously photography is always evolving and you always have to learn stuff, but uh, it wasn't evolving as quickly then. Cause you know, we weren't doing video on DSLRs and, um, you know, digital had been around for a while. So, um, I, I, I wanted to expand my horizons. I knew that I could do more with photography, but I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and I really wanted just two years to focus on my work and not have to try to make a living and live and take, you know, be responsible, <laughs> not that you're not responsible in grad school, but so that for me, that was the reason. Uh, and then I, you know, back to your question, as far as it seems that people that have a formal education have more of a um, artistic bent. I mean, part of that could be, and I think it really depends on what school you go to and what program, but you really, you're getting like, for me, I got an MFA. It's a master of fine arts. Right. Um, with an emphasis in photography, right? You choose your medium. Um, but you're in an art school with, you know, a whole bunch of other artists from a whole bunch of different disciplines. I went to VCU down in Richmond, which is very interdisciplinary. You know, I was taking classes in the ceramics department just to, you know, it was, I wanted to be exposed to not necessarily learning those, those mediums, but being around other artists and the way they think people who work in ceramics or sculpture or painting or, you know, fabric and material studies. So for me, that just really kind of blew the lid off uh, the idea of art making, regardless of what the medium is. Right. And for me, the medium happened to be photography. Um, but it did blow the lid off those two years in graduate school for me of what, what photography could be. And it was so much bigger than what I had been practicing and right. what I had thought of. And I think a lot of people have this idea of what photography is. And it's there's it's so much more. It can really be anything you want it to be. Sure. So it was really interesting and fun and, like I said, mind-blowing to take my really strong technical understanding and then just be able to explore anything that came into my mind and any idea I had. And so, yeah, it, it completely changed the way I look at photography, the way I teach photography, the way I do photography. Yeah. It was pivotal. Yeah. Yeah. And how would you, how would you describe to others uh, what your photography is about or what type of photography are you engaged in? Currently. Yeah. Okay, because like I said, it yeah, is involved. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, the cycles, depending on where I am in my life, physically and emotionally and intellectually, totally. yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's evolved and changed so much. Um, I mean, currently, uh, I have what I would call a dream job for me. Uh, it's part time, but uh, the Montana Museum of Art and Culture here in Missoula, Montana, um, it's been around for 125 years. It's like the biggest collection of um, art in the state of Montana, state affiliated, university affiliated. And I have come on board with them in the last few years as their photographer and videographer. Um, and so I do the virtual tours and sometimes we do interviews. But m most importantly, recently, um, we finally got a, a 
a huge donation and a, well, a lot of other donations and are building a new museum to house the entire collection. And so it's a collection of over 12,000 pieces. And while we're in the process of cataloging and moving this collection, we figured this is the ideal time to photograph every piece that's in the collection. Mm -hmm. And so I built a studio and it is, for me, it's a dream job because I get to use all my technical skills. It's problem solving. And I get to see amazing art every day. I get to be in a room with Picassos and Chagalls and, uh, you know, the list goes on and on, the kind of art that we have. And yeah. artists I haven't heard of and contemporary artists and student art. Um, and so, you know, even though that's not my personal work, which I'll get to, like I said, it's, it's you know, I love combining the technical with the problem solving and then just being around right. beautiful art every day and also trying to show that art in its best light and most accurate way. Yeah, um, no, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so that's just a big part of what I'm doing right now. And it is so interesting and it just, for me, it really combines and I'm a huge fan of history, including art history, not just photo history. So uh, it just combines everything that I'm interested in. And so that's really great. Uh, and then I, there's a lot of videography happening in my life as well um, and video editing. And I, I love that challenge because that is always learning and new conditions and mm -hmm. evolving technology. And so that just keeps me on my toes and it's challenging. Um, you know, I don't... It, it's not as much of a comfort zone as photography. I mean, I understand my craft and I know what I'm doing, but again, I think video keeps you on your toes a, a lot. For sure. Yeah, no, it's a whole other it's a whole other beast. <laughs> yeah, there's there's audio, there's, you know, there's right. <laughs> all sorts of all sorts of elements and dealing with people and interviewing and so I I really adore all the videography happening. Um and then for personally, uh, really in the last, and maybe it's because I'm working so much for my work with the camera and video and photography, but really in the last five years, I've been drawing more. Oh, wow. Um, but it's always photo based. So I'm almost always including archival photographs that I find. Hmm. Um, and then I manipulate them and I turn them into line drawings and I project them and then I trace them and then they become drawings oh, and wow. I do composites in Photoshop with them. So, you know, even though I say I'm drawing, no matter what way I'm using photography, mixed media, you know, paint, uh, transfers, whatever, um, there's always a photo element that's that's behind it all. And so the, the drawings of the last few years are always, like I said, using archival photographs um, and turning them into something else. Maybe give an example of a, of a piece that you created that, you know, like what did it start out as and then what did you want to turn it into or what did you want to say with it? Sure, yeah. Um, so I did a series that really started this whole body of work and it's evolved into a lot of different things. But um, I, uh, there's an author, Yasunari, Yasunari Kawabata, a Japanese um, author who's been long gone. He died in 72, um, but he was the first Nobel Prize winner for literature out of Japan. Hmm. And I found his work and I absolutely fell in love with his writing and I devoured everything that he wrote. And I just became, you know, I call him my muse. I became really obsessed with his writing and his life and who he was and his ideas. And so I started finding old archival photographs of Kawabata and creating this process and creating these large drawings of him. And I probably did 10 or 15 of those. And then that branched into uh, important women in Kawabata's life. Hmm. And then I did a series of them and that has now evolved into, um, I'm fa I'm fascinated with Japanese culture. And so that has now evolved into, uh, finding some of the beautiful, there's so many, um, archival images of geishas. Oh, okay. And so I take those and then I, um, create landscapes. And so my latest project is the sort of geisha in a surreal landscape or hmm. sort of attached to or turning into a landscape. Oh, yeah. Um, 
And so as that's the visuals, but you know, as far as the ideas, honestly, Matt, the way I generally work is, I mean, ideas are crucial. I don't, I don't think art is interesting without ideas. <laughs> um, but rather than get too caught up in the idea first, which is what I learned in graduate school. Um, now I just have learned to intuitively run with my ideas, intuitively just go down a path and learn what the ideas and motivations are as I go. The work reveals that to me over time. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, and so uh, you, but that this, all of this work has really just started with my, you know, just very strong interest in Kawabata and allowing you myself to follow that train without wondering about where it was going to go or what it was about. Um, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So obviously 90% of our listeners are going to be landscape and nature photographers. And mm -hmm. this idea of art uh, and landscape photography is a tricky one that constantly okay. comes up in conversation. Um, and that's why I love having conversations with people like you who haven't necessarily forced yourself to wrestle with that necessarily because you're not confined by the genre um mm -hmm. and so i'm curious if you have any advice for people who are into landscape and nature photography specifically but they also want their photographs to kind of transcend into more of an artistic um, piece or have their mm -hmm. work kind of you know like you said have an idea about it yeah absolutely I mean, I, I get a lot of clients in my consulting business for that reason, that they've been photographers for a long time. You know, they're technically adept. They have been making work and they just feel like there's something else yeah. or they want to push it beyond. I mean, I'd say that's the top type of client I get. Uh, and I mean, I could talk about this for hours, Matt. <laughs> I could take it in so many different directions, but I've always said that creativity can be learned like any other thing. It can be learned like skiing. It can be learned like drawing. It can be learned like cooking, language. Uh, but we have this stigma in our society that creativity is either something you're born with or, right. you know, the clouds open, the light comes down and you're blessed, right? Right. Um, and that is just not the case. Because if you study any great artist throughout history from the Renaissance, you know, to, to Mark Rothko, they learned, they practiced, they worked hard, they were devoted. I mean, it's like anything else. The more time and energy you put into it, the more it will expand mm -hmm. and the more you will understand your own creative path because it's unique and individual. We all have our own, right? So no one can tell you what your path is. You know, even with my clients, I tr that's why I say I try to guide, but I can't tell someone where to go and right. what their path is. So as far as, um, and the other thing I want to say before I move on is, you know, this idea, which it used to come up in my classes all the time in photography school, um, is what is art and how do I know when it's art or when it's not? And, you know, I just, just totally dismissed that question. <laughs> it's just not worth having that conversation. <laughs> what is art? You know, I mean, according to whom, according to what, know. you know, I mean, it's, you can say it's subjective. Some people say everything can be art. You know, I disagree with that. But it's just, to me, it's just not an important question. How I used to answer that is, let's not talk about what is art. Let's talk about what an artist is. Mm. And an artist is someone who devotes a large amount of their time, energy, thinking to their work over a long period of time. If you do that, then I think you're an artist. And what you make is irrelevant as far as is it art, is it not all that, right? So first I would say that to people who want the advice is to not get caught up in that. Is it art, is it not? Am I an artist, am I not? Um, mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, if you're a landscape or nature photographer, I mean, there's always the uh, chance to get into sort of some alternative printing, which could take it to an, a different place. But some people don't want to do that and, and that's okay. And oh, then- and, and I have- Lots of questions for you about that. Okay, great. So great. we'll save those for later. <laughs> sure. So that's one avenue, um, but maybe more, more, at, more central or at home from the making of the images versus what you can do with them later. Is I would, it's what I said before. Is you know, I forget which famous artist said it. I don't think it was Picasso, but 
that, you know, there was a quote that says something like, you know, art is more interesting with ideas. Mm. And so it's about the intent and the ideas behind your work. That's what elevates it and changes it. And that doesn't mean it has to be some large overarching idea, like some big conceptual thing. I tell my clients this all the time. It can be something simple. It can be revisiting the same place over and over and over again. Look at Georgia O'Keeffe in Mexico, mm-hmm. right? It's being, it's allowing, it's opening yourself up to the possibilities uh, to what your, what's, you know, fueling your juices and what's getting you excited and then, and then exploring that, right? And not being worried about, is it, are, are people going to like this? Because when you're excited and passionate about something, then that's going to fuel you. It's going to show in the work. Um, And you just got to kind of have faith and trust that it's going to lead to something interesting because you're interested. And and not worry about if there's people out there that are also going to be interested, right? So maybe it's just a favorite place you want to explore over time. Maybe it's an idea. Maybe it's a town. Maybe it's some history you've learned, you know, maybe it's some story you want to tell. It doesn't have to be, uh, like I said, huge, but I do think focusing on, you know, an idea or a project, a long, long long-term projects I have found for my clients have transformed their approach to photography and their discipline in photography. And so, um, any, any kind of project or series of work, that is about more than, than just, no, I'm not even going to finish that sentence. That's just about more. How about that? <laughs> no, I think that's perfect. And you answered that question about as well as I could hope anyone answer it. So I well, appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, let's, let's run with a little bit more of this theme of, of creativity. Um, one of the main reasons I was excited to get you on the podcast is you have such a large focus on creativity and it's something that, comes up over and over again in in the genre of nature and landscape photography, especially because there's a lot of copying and it's, it's Mm. hard to be creative and original, um, in this genre, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how you help others uh, get more Mm -hmm. in touch with the creative process and walk us through what that looks like in your, in your teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, Let's let's run through like if a client comes to me from any genre, and again, very often it's I want to embark on a long term project, or very often again it's someone who's been doing photography. They're you know it's they're technically adept, they've learned a lot, and they just feel like there's something else, and there's somewhere else they can go with yeah. their work. So I always start with you know. A, questionnaire, but you know, I, I want to get to know that person more. I want to see their photography. I want to know their experience. I want to know who they are. I want to know bubbling under the surface for them, mm-hmm. you know, cause inevitably almost everyone, if I ask, are there, is there anything you'd like to learn or anything you've thought you wanted to explore or any ideas pop into your head for a project? There's, there's always something, right? Mm-hmm. There's always like, well, I always considered this or I've thought about this. So it's there. They just need the permission and the guidance and the, you know, maybe some a little bit of pushing encouragement to actually embark on this journey that they've been that's there somewhere. Sometimes they need help exploring what it is. Right. They just uh, they can't pinpoint what it is they want to what where they want to go with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and more often than not, like I said, Matt, it's people need permission. Hmm and encouragement to just run with the ideas they already have, right? Um, So that's really the beginning. And then we sort of identify, you know, sometimes I have to pull out of people these ideas um, and kind of nurture and, you know, get them to discover what these ideas are. Other times people just have the ideas and they need me to either encourage them, always encourage them, Um, But sometimes they just need focus. They need me to say, well, try this and let's focus on this because it's overwhelming if you haven't either done a long term project or done try to embark on this other level of creativity. It's overwhelming for people and intimidating. And so it's just like I said about encouragement and, and sometimes giving people direction and 
and deadlines and accountability, <laughs> accountability when they have to come back to me and just show me what they did. And it's not about judgment. It's about, okay, you did something right. great. Right. You, you took a couple steps down this path. It's like, you know, if you're building this path, rather than worry about what the path's going to look like and where it's going to go and what materials it's made out of, you know, I say like, put the next two stepping stones down, take those steps, and then we'll look to see where it's going and how it's meandering and what materials it is. But let's not worry about the entire path. Let's just worry about the next, you know, couple steps. And so sometimes, often, that's just what people need is that that guidance and and then sometimes it's practical stuff like people have I have clients who have never had an exhibit and never framed work and then I guide them with that or or people who want to learn more about printing or people who want to learn about more about photo history or you know it, there's there's different ways that people need it but um, it is always start does always start with me is trying to figure out get to know the person a little bit get to see what their photography is and then try to sort of mine out of them where they really probably already know they want to go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for me. I've always found that uh, a big part of it for folks is, you know, just knowing yourself, um, understanding what gets you excited, what makes you tick as a person, um, you know, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are you interested in? And then oftentimes the answers to those questions can often lead you in some really interesting directions. Absolutely. Yep, yep. And, you know, I, I, I really I'm kind of obsessed. I taught a class on it years ago and I read a lot about muses mm -hmm. um, and and there is a lot in the history of photography and there is a lot in art history in general. Um, but what I love about that so much, you know, even using Georgia O'Keeffe as an example or, or there's so many others, is that it is what I love about the idea of the artist muse and a muse can be a place. It can be a person. It doesn't have to be right. Mine is a, you know, long gone deceased Japanese, the ghost of Kawabata. Um, but what I love about the idea of the muse is it's the artist allowing themselves to be taken, mm. right. Allowing yourself to just be totally consumed and taken by a place, a person, something. And it's, that's, that's to me a little bit of what what creativity is about is this again just allowing yourself to to go wherever you want to go right um twyla tharp who wrote the creative habit has a great quote where she says um grab you know something along the lines of like when you find that fire in the back hall grab it and run like hell <laughs> you know like just when you when you find something you got to grab it and run with it you know so yeah. um yeah yeah, what I found too is um, I think a lot of people, they have an idea, but they often get stuck around kind of the logistics or the, you know, the how or the, you know, it's like, yes. oh, okay, I want to, I want to photograph a series of winter trees or whatever, but then it's like, mm -hmm. but how many should I do? Or, you know, like, and like, I think people get, often they get kind of stuck in the, the minutia of, of yes. the work instead of just go do the work and then come back and maybe get some feedback from some people to say, okay, now how do I consolidate this to make, make it actually make sense? <laughs> exactly. You're so right. And also not only doing the work and then getting the feedback, but as I said earlier, the work informs you, right? The work is what, you know, the work is, the work is the creativity. Right. I mean, you're the creativity, but the work is the creativity. So if you want to be creative, you got to bring the work in, into life. You got right. to breathe some life into it and that it will breathe back to you. And it's this, it's this conversation between you and the work you make. And only that can, can really be the thing that guides you. I mean, I can be out here helping and guiding and nurturing, but it's the work that's going to, you know, say you do, are doing a project in the winter trees. The more you're actively out there in the cold photographing the trees and seeing the trees and making photographs of the trees and editing and looking, the more you're going to start to understand what it is you're drawn to this, why you're drawn to this. And you, it's, you know, it's this cycle. So uh, you're right. There's, I have so many students and clients who do get caught in the minutia or the doubts or, well, oh, it's just trees. My, why, why oh, should I, I not that. I know. And it's like, well, there's, I mean, that's like, you know, Harry Callahan saying, oh, it's just my wife. 
you know, or, <laughs> or, uh, you know, Edward Weston saying, oh, it's just any subject, right? He photographed right. everything. Oh, it's just a shell. Oh, it's just right. a pepper. It's just oh, a pepper. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just a toilet. You right. know, I mean, it's it, Uta Barth, the great contemporary German photographer saying it's just, uh, you know, the curtains in my house. It's just light coming in my window. That's, you know, right. again, that's sort of this irrelevant, like it, it is what it is. And if you are drawn to it, and that's the other thing I do a lot in my consulting and with my teaching is um, if someone is drawn to something, it's not only about pointing that out to them and giving them guidance, but is really digging in. Why are you interested in this? What is it about it? That's that mining I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. that's that also people taking their work to another level is not over intellectualizing it, but, you know, sort of digging in there and go, well, what is it about winter trees that are so enthralling to me? Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, what is it about Kawabata? What is it about Japanese culture? What is it about geishas? What is it about drawing 10,000 tiny dots on a piece of paper, right? So it's, again, it's not over analyzing, but it's getting to know, like you said earlier, know yourself, know why it is you're drawn to it, know what excites you about it. And then the conversation can begin. I love that. I love that. Yeah, one thing I've always struggled with for myself, yeah, it's just beautiful mountains or whatever. Um, but, but also it can be so much more than that. Um, you know, you can tell different stories. There's metaphors within metaphors. There's, um, you know, the whole minor white saying of well, what else is it? You know, it's yes. like, there's so many of those little vignettes that are within a photograph. If you just take the time to, to look for them and to, to notice them. Absolutely. There's metaphor in everything and it's your experience and your way of seeing this. And, you know, as I said earlier, if, if every great, we'll stick to photography, if every great photographer said, it's only that I'm not going to shoot it, we'd have no great historical photographers right. or contemporary, you know, I mean, so you got to get that idea out of your head. Like you said, it's just that, or, or this has been done before, you know, it's all been done before not by you in this time in this way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, right. There's a great quote by Martha Graham. I, I should have it memorized because I always <laughs> want to say it and I don't want to butcher it. But there is this beautiful quote by Martha Graham. Maybe I'll send it to you after the podcast. But it, it's basically her saying, this is your one chance, you know, unless you believe in reincarnation. But even then you're going to be something else, right? <laughs> this is your one chance when you're on this planet to be the one unique person you are. And so if, if you are create, if, if you believe you are an artist or you have some expression or something to say, you know, it's your responsibility to do that. And if you don't, you've missed a great opportunity. Right. And it. so, yeah. And so that's another thing. Sometimes I just need to encourage people to say, you know, your, your ideas are important. Who you are is important. Your creative life is important. Because, you know, in society, especially in creativity has become a real, you know, buzzword now, right? Um, but right. in the past, not only was it always something that, again, people didn't think they could learn, but it was discouraged, you know, in a lot of people, right? Art is not, I'm talking not value as far as the dollar, because that's a whole other absurd conversation, the value monetarily of art and how it's used in our world, but the value of art as an as as an art maker, as what you contribute, as sharing your ideas, expressing who you are, that's potentially not valued as much as it certainly could be in our world for, you know, ha has never been and still isn't. And right. so sometimes people just need that encouragement. Well, I mean, that's a whole other ball of wax in terms of yeah. like monetary value, not necessarily being the pinnacle of artistic success. I mean, I feel like if you are creating something that you personally enjoy and you are getting value out of as a, as an individual and as a bonus, if other people enjoy your work as well, that's even cooler, exactly. but money doesn't necessarily have to enter into that equation at all. It does not. And as you said, I love the way you said that. And it's so true. If someone, if other people happen to enjoy the work bonus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
And it doesn't mean that we don't, if if we're artists and and photographers, okay, we're there. We don't just do it for our own pleasure. Even it's a very altruistic thing, even though it really is for our own pleasure, meaning we want other people to see it and like it. Of course. I've met a few, I've met a few odd ducks that they've said, I don't care if other people, uh, like my photographer even see my photography. And actually I believe them like, Having them mm-hmm. even like come on the show and share my their photos with me, I was like pulling, yeah. pulling teeth. But yeah, I yeah. think that's no, pretty I, rare. <laughs> yeah, and I I totally agree. I definitely feel like that sometimes. Uh, but you know, the point I'm getting to is is you, the point that you had just made is it it can't be the 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 goal or purpose of of art making. And we're not talking about commercial professional photography where you're working for a client and the goal is to give the client what they want. Right. We're talking about our own art making process. And and you're right. I mean, if someone else likes it, bonus. Yeah, that's and, the way I and, feel anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, the other thing I've said and written about this before is kind of along the lines of Martha Graham is, you know, it's your responsibility to, if you feel the need to express or be creative or be an artist this time on the planet, all you can do is put it out there and you never know when you're going to influence someone or Mm -hmm. when they're going to see your work and have a moment or when they're going to be changed or excited. You don't know that. And, and, you know, I mean, I've had, I've had, crises over the last many decades of like, what am I doing here? I'm not feeding starving children. I mean, I'm not saving the world. Like it's, it's very navel gazing, making art sometimes. What's the point? And I always have to remember those moments in my life that I have seen someone else's art and it's transformed me or it's maybe just brightened my day or it's made me feel something. Mm-hmm. And and that artist had no idea that that was going to happen for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the other thing I try to kind of hang on to and tell clients as well is you just got to put it out there and you never know when and who you're going to, you're going to touch or move. Yep. No, I, yeah. I totally agree with that. I mean, I've, on this podcast, I've heard so many photographers tell me stories about people who have reached out to them with these incredible reactions that they had to their photographs like your photograph literally helped me get through the passing of my husband or you know stuff like that and it's like wow it people it does impact people so it's oftentimes we don't hear about it but it does happen correct yeah and we have to just you know that can't be a part of the intention we don't we just have to put it out there and then and then what happens to it after it's out there and what it does to people is is you know it's up to the universe at that point Absolutely. Well, I want to shift gears and I do want to get us to talk more about alternative printmaking. I promise we'll get there because I know a lot of people are sure. interested in that. But I had one more question before that. Yeah. You used to publish a quarterly magazine called Butterflies and Anvils. Mm-hmm. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about um, what that project is, was about, why you started it, and maybe even talk about why you don't do it anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> It's so interesting how much that comes up and I, I keep wondering if it means I have to do right. something else with it. Right. The universe um, is talking to you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, it was a labor of love, um, really was a labor of love. And the labor part is, I think, what made me stop because <laughs> I was essentially a, a one person show uh, putting out a quarterly magazine that was 80 pages Oof. with an interview of an artist, articles on creativity. Man. I mean, it was it was a lot. And I, when I when I started it, my idea, the reason I started it is because, well, again, it was a bit of that just intuitive calling of like, huh, I kind of want to do this. I didn't overthink it too much, but um, I was writing a lot about photography and creativity. I was teaching full time. I, the majority of what I was teaching at that point, in addition to photo history, was creativity and the whole visual side of photography and this all this that we're talking about. And I could feel that people were just thirsty for it, mm-hmm. right? All of my students were like, no one talks about this. And again, like I said, now creativity has become a real buzzword. This was, you know, 10 plus years ago. But um, I, I just suddenly thought, you know, people, people want to hear about this. People in photography do want to, um, they want to be exposed to other things, right? 
So it just seemed like a natural thing to do. And so I decided I wanted to interview a different artist for every issue. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to interview, you know, big people, um, Jill Enfield out of New York City, um, Forrest Woodward, who's an amazing travel photographer, um, you know, Gabriel Biderman for B&H, who does the National Parks at Night. Um, and then I did some unknown people, you know, either friends of mine or students that I had that were young and emerging. And so each issue was uh, the majority of it half of it was an interview with the artist and showing their work mm -hmm. um and it wasn't about what camera you used and how you got started it was it was a conversation about creativity basically what we're doing now right um and so i would and i tried to get different um not only you know uh, emerging artists and really successful artists but i got people from all different genres you know maybe forrest was a travel photographer and gabriel was doing um, night photography and another person was all dark room and another person was a professional portrait Allison Leach out of you know retired professional uh, portrait photographer um, who you know photographed commercially so um, I just tried to really be diverse in who I interviewed and then the rest of it was um, there were usually three articles something about creativity I included poetry which was mine when I started haikus but then I tried to incorporate other people's poetry a lot of it was this obsession that I have with word and image. Um, I really am always trying to figure out, because I love to read, I love language, I love writing, and so I'm always trying to figure out how to combine the two. And this was just one of those manifestations. Um, and, and it was fun, because it was mine, so I could do whatever I wanted. So I also put like a seasonal recipe in every one. <laughs> That's awesome. And I did one little product review, and it was never like, a camera it was like a polaroid camera or you know just something fun mm -hmm. um and so that project was i mean i i loved every minute of it it was so interesting it was this huge expression of my creativity and then showing other people's you know work and life and passion but it was four years and it was it was all consuming and i was also teaching full time and That's you know i do have a personal life and <laughs> and you know my my hope was when i started that it would grow into something bigger that i would maybe eventually have a staff or have people help and have contributors and that the readership would grow mm -hmm. um and that the you know subscriptions would grow so that it could sort of um you know maintain itself right or grow right. and and so much of what i do and i don't mean I, this is not a negative thing but i think it's just what what being a creative is about is so often on my down days i could look back and be like wow look at all these awesome projects i launched and started and then had to stop <laughs> because they just, <laughs> right? they just didn't blow up into the thing that i imagined or they like i said they just couldn't sustain themselves anymore mm -hmm. but that's you know, you, at least you try. And I do have that expression and there's still evidence and there's still people who talk about the magazine and it's still available to buy. And still every year I have someone who buys that magazine and says, oh my gosh, this is, thank you so much. Right. And When's so, the next issue coming out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, you know, I've talked with friends who've been encouraging me. I've really, in the last few years, thought, you know, one of my friends said, what if you just did an annual Butterflies mm -hmm. and Wombles? You know, or maybe even every couple years, a special edition comes out because so many people liked it and so many people have benefited from it. So it's there on my radar. I just, me, myself and I solo could not go back to the yeah. quarterly publication, but it was really a labor of love. Yeah. yeah, I feel like those kind of projects to really sustain them you need to collaborate with others who Absolutely. have a lot of skin in the game and yep have some skill sets that maybe you don't have and those kind exactly. of things you know yeah and i was a lot younger and a little more inexperienced but yes absolutely and I, you know i tried to collaborate but yeah it just didn't it didn't it didn't have a life of its own at the time yeah yeah well and it's hard times with projects like that you have the passion you have the ideas but like you have to put food on the table, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it's like your time gets, it's like, well, I can either work on that thing, which gives me like $50 yeah. a year, or I can work on yeah. this other thing that actually pays my rent. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. 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 Yeah, yeah. That's hard. Well, <laughs> so if you were to kick it off again, what, what would you do differently? If I were to kick it off in its new or, form or a different, yeah, a different type of 
format? Or? Well, I do. I do think it it couldn't be quarterly unless it somehow grew into that with help and collaboration, like you said. Yeah. Um, I have really entertained the idea of an annual, um, and I would I would definitely include you know the interviews with other artists because that was the most enjoyable part for me is mm -hmm. sitting down like this and having a conversation about creativity with people. Right. And then and then showing their work. You know, I, again, this wasn't a navel gazing thing. I wanted to show other people's writing and work and ideas and yeah. And so. Um, I think, you know, I think on that note, I, I think there would be more of a recruiting of who I wanted to share and then put the thing out. Where mm -hmm. with this, I was like every few months, you know, as soon as one was done, I was already into the next one and mm -hmm. into the next one. And um, so, yeah, I think there'd be it'd be less on the fly and, you know, more gathering the community of who I wanted to share their ideas and do it and then put it out there. Right. Yeah. Well, hopefully you do that. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> All right. As <laughs> promised, let's talk about alternative printing. Okay. Um, so I feel like so many photographers nowadays are 100% digital. They rarely print their photographs. And if they do print their photographs, they're probably like me and they're having a lab do it for them, which is totally fine. But um, oh. I feel like for a lot of people, the, the final product, the print, doesn't even factor into the equation. And I'm curious, from your perspective, what can we learn as artists by being a bit more hands-on in our process? And how do you think it transforms our photo photography? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. Again, that could be a whole other hour. <laughs> Sorry. <podcast. laughs> no, no, it's okay. No, it's like I love having all these things to talk about that are so rich and deep and I have so many opinions on. <laughs> um, yeah, printing is uh, a whole other part of photography that often gets neglected. And it wasn't when we were in the dark room because it was the only way you could. Right. It was a necessity. <laughs> it was a necessity. You couldn't show people your negatives, right? Right. Um, so it was an integral part. I mean, Ansel Adams made his series, right? The, mm -hmm. the negative, the, you know, the print was one whole book. Right. Um, and, and so it was such an integral part of being a photographer. And, and I do feel like it's, it's gone by the wayside a little bit. I do want to say, like you just said, there's no problem with using a lab. If you need consistency and you need perfection and you need, quick turnaround to get to a client or to get to a show, um, it's a logical way to go, right? Um, Absolutely. And, and the other thing I would say is that not even talking about alternative printing, but talking about printing in general, it's a beast. It's not something you just pick up and do on the side. It's a whole other thing you have to learn right. and understand and maintain and grow. You know, you have to, it, it's, it's not a simple part of photography, right? right. It's, it's, it's in some ways, it's like, okay, I learned how to take the picture, which is like, you know, five years of hard work yeah, <laughs> or right. 10 or whatever. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, now I'm going to print the picture. And that's like basically starting over from scratch. <laughs> it is. It really is. And so I always sort of preface this conversation with that, that some people, that's not where they want to put their time. Mm -hmm. or maybe they don't want to learn maybe they just they just want to pay someone to make a beautiful print and that's absolutely fine um so however it is i do think whether you want to print yourself or use a lab i do think it's a it's an opportunity in the creative process for another way to express yourself uh or to be unique or to make something beautiful that often does get dropped and neglected by photographers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, meaning this direct line from what we photograph to digital file, to computer, to world, right? right? And it's like, hey, wait a minute. There's all these ways in between that, in that process that can, that are opportunities, like I said, to produce some beautiful things that people can appreciate. And one of them is a print. Well, um, to your point, the print itself, I mean, beyond your personal vision and the subjects and the way you capture images, all that, the actual way you present your work on a print is another opportunity to differentiate yourself as an art artist. Absolutely. And I mean, think about it. This is where, uh, you know, I, I get frustrated. It's 
I don't know that we're there anymore, but it used to be this way. We're like, you know, I always say photography was the other ugly stepsister of the arts, right? Right. Meaning it came so much later. Uh, it often hasn't been respected. Um, it was neglected in the art world. You know, so I could go on and on in the history of that. But if you think about it, in a way, we are the only medium where you don't have to have a physical object, right? A dancer doesn't just put a video recording of their dance out everywhere and you never see them live. Uh, you know, a painter, you can't be a successful painter and have a whole everything, all of your work is online, but you've never actually shown a painting. Sculpture, if you just, if people just saw pictures of your sculpture online, but never experienced the three-dimensional experience of the material and the, the space, you wouldn't be a great sculptor architects, right? Writers and books. I guess you could argue the writer book thing could be different because people might not look at physical books anymore. But every other medium, there is a physical either object or aspect to the medium. So who do we think we are? <laughs> <laughs> or we don't have to do that or that that's not a part of our creative process. Right. It's, it's, it's an oversight sometimes, I think. And like I said, an, an opportunity. And that doesn't mean that every every way we photograph needs to end up in a print. However, it, it, it's another way to, like I said, express your ideas or make something beautiful. And so, and it's a whole other way to tap into your own creativity. And it's, it's another way to sort of explore and force yourself to make decisions and choose surfaces and choose scale and ask questions. Well, what scale should this be? Well, what surface should it be? What, what kind of framing, what kind of presentation, right? It's just, it's, it's more steps along the creative path. It's another little journey you can take, or you could just never, ever do that. Um, and, and the other thing I've noticed from judging contests and, you know, being juror and things like that is, and this is nitpicking a little bit, but I do find when people do decide to print, whether it's uh, having a lab do it or do that themselves, they often get stuck in that format of like eight and a half by 11, 11 right. by 14, right. maybe, maybe 13 by 19, because that's as big as the printer goes, um, the semi-affordable printer. And, and that's all fine to start, but there, it's like I said in the very beginning of the podcast in graduate school, there are a million different ways that you can physically show your photographs that are not an eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 14 glossy photo. Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? Every, every image has its own way it wants to be shown, but it's, the possibilities are endless. And, and that gets into more of this alternative printing world where the opportunities are literally endless. Yeah, so it's let just me, a maybe, maybe let's, let's talk a little bit more specifically about that. Um, Maybe tell us some of the alternative materials that you work with to make prints and why you've chosen those materials to begin with. I've, I've worked with every material almost you can imagine <laughs> in graduate school exploration. I mean, I used to make these little objects that I thought were artistic and my studio mate said it looked like an Ikea lamp. You know, I was, <laughs> I was making things out of gel medium and you know, my other studio mate laughed that I was going to have a, you know, exhibition where I suspended myself in a ball of gel medium, meaning <laughs> I have I have used every, any material that I could get my hands on. Right. So and it didn't matter if it was in the photographic realm. Or, and that was partially because my fellow MFA students in photography and my very close studio mates, uh, you know, one was a painter. And another one was a filmmaker using actual film. And so I was exposed to all sorts of different materials mm -hmm. and different ways of, you know, especially my, my, um, I had two great, I still, still great friends. If you're out there, guys, I know you are. Robbie Land was the filmmaker. He's out of Atlanta, Georgia. And Tom Condon was the painter. Those were my studio mates and kind of best buds there. And Tom Condon's in Richmond, Virginia. And both of them, again, helped me blow the lid off of how you can, what photography is. And so, you know, whether it was fire or gel medium or wax or paint or anything. And so, and I'm not- Fire. I'm not, <laughs> fire. Tom Condon showed me how to use fire with my, with my work. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this to overwhelm everyone like, oh, you need to go light your stuff on fire. You got to, you know, probably rein it back in and maybe baby step a little bit. But my point is, is by having those two years where I went so far out there and was just had the freedom to take any material and use it has, has made me now be okay with that. And also, you know, understand that it's like, if, you know, that thing of like, if you dream it, I, I could, we could probably figure out how to make a print out of it. We could probably figure out how to get your image on whatever that material is. And so as far, you know, again, as far as the materials I've worked with, um, but in my workshops to teach people and, and introduce them into this world, um, we do a lot of image transfers, uh, and, and it's really about printing on all sorts of different materials. So everybody sort of starts with a kit of materials and that kit will include rice paper, canvas, uh, vellum, wood, metal, sometimes fabric, you know, I basically start them out, you know, I mean, I'll go to our local like home resource reclamation place and get tiles or get things for cheap. And it's really fun when I see my students come and they see these materials <laughs> on the table right, and they're like, put my phone what? On this? <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so yeah, and that's what we do. And then I show them how to do that. So it's kind of two paths. There's, there's the path of getting your image on a substrate that can't go through a printer, tile, wood, glass. Those are usually transfers. And then there's anything that can get through a printer. There's different products. I love the one called InkAid, but Golden and a bunch of other companies make them. And it's, it's a special material that you coat paper or any, any substrate with, and it will now accept inkjet ink. So, so that again could be, I mean, you could print on toilet paper, you could print on, you know, I mean, anything that you can get through a printer. And again, I have to teach all these ways that you can get something like toilet paper or, you know, because obviously some things you try to put through a printer will just fall apart, but that's where we put them on a hard substrate. And we, so I have all these ways of showing people, again, if you have an idea of what you can print on, we can figure out how to get a photograph onto it. So let's talk a little bit more abstract for a second. So why would somebody decide, you know, my photograph looks really good on paper, but yep. why would I want to put it on, let's say, toilet paper or wood or some yeah. other material that, you know, has a totally different finish? Like, what are some of the or... practical reasons for that? Or rice paper, right? right? Or no, but <laughs> or a burrito or something. I don't know. Well, yeah, but seriously, <laughs> about that. Even with me doing, um, you know, in work influenced by Japanese art hmm. and mm -hmm. culture, why wouldn't it be a logical step for me to jump to rice paper yeah. or silk mm -hmm. or or uh, you know? I mean, I did a, a series on handmade Japanese paper that actually had tree bark in it, and mm. my images were images of trees, right? So there's that part of like, wow, just another connection mm -hmm. and another another material, another way to um, express an idea that you have. Right, like it's not um, just an image; it's also the material itself that takes on the story. Exactly. You know, I mean, I can think of a million reasons you would maybe want to print on wood or glass, you know, or ref you know, maybe it's about reflections and you want to be on a reflective material, right? Mm -hmm. So things like that. So there's, there's first that idea of, wow, what could I do to further this idea that I have in my head um, with materials? Uh, but then the other thing is, is um, there's two parts to this that I think why my students are interested and in come to the class or, or people are interested and one is that hands-on tactile mm -hmm. thing, you know, get, getting messy, you know, like working with wet materials and having to let things dry and having to do a coat and let it dry and another coat and let it dry and another coat and let it dry. And then, you know, and sometimes it doesn't work. And that's the first thing I say to my students when they come in, like, you're going to leave here with a boatload <laughs> of really cool prints, but there's also going to be some things that go in the trash. <laughs> Because nothing is guaranteed. It's an, it's an experimental medium, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so there's that aspect of the experimentation of it and the exploration that's really exciting, uh, especially in our digital world where if you have full control, sometimes there's no mistakes at all. Mm -hmm. If you have full control of your medium, where's the surprise? 
Mm. Not that there can't be even in straight shooting. There absolutely can be. Um, but it allows people to sort of have this freedom to explore. And also, I think it's a good um, exercise of that creative muscle to watch the people in my class. And even when I do it myself, of not be able to predict exactly what the outcome is going to be or have a visual of what the outcome is going to be. But it's something slightly different. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or something doesn't turn out like you expected. And then we have to we have to U-turn or take a left turn and go, well, what could we do with it now? And so that's a really fun part of the process for people is that exploration, creativity, uh, the unexpected. Um, and then the other reason is, you know, people people want something unique, mm -hmm. you know, which is what we talked about earlier is, you know, Everybody who leaves my class, no one's print looks like the other person's print. It's, right. you know, even if they're both on metal or even if they're both on glass because it's their handmade way of doing it. And so it, it, it really creates a unique object. Mm -hmm. um, and probably, I, I would guess, depending on the medium, almost not replicable. Correct. Yes. We're with inkjet printing. You know, you could call your lab and be like, I need 100 copies of that. And they are going to be exact. Right. Or very, um, very close. Pretty darn close. Yeah, yeah. Even in the dark room, nothing was ever exact, but pretty darn close. Right. Um, and so, yeah, these this is, um, you know, you could get close with replicating if you if you really practice a method of I'm going to do this on this substrate, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's it's, it's unique. And yeah, it's there's a, it's, copy it, variation. Like yeah, it's. Yeah. It's a handmade object. Right. It's a handmade object is what it is. Yeah. And and not to go there, but let's go there. Um, do you think <laughs> that increases its monetary value? <laughs> in this in in our current art environment world, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. but you know, it's like so, then you have to get into where's the market for that and who's the who's the you know, where are you showing it and you know. I don't necessarily think that's the case. But I do feel like, you know, and this has been my experience on the few juried exhibits I've been a part of where, you know, I've got a straight acrylic print on the wall and someone rolls in with this really interesting <laughs> mixed media photograph with that has like... 3D objects hanging off of it. And I'm like, how am I supposed to compete against that? You know, right, you right. Know? but yeah. it's like, I'm sure that they're going to win because it looks way more interesting than my photograph, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know. I would say from the juror's perspective, I've, pro I, I'm, I've probably been guilty of that, but I would say, and not that this is the case with you and your work, but in the past, when I've juried things, if, if for any reason I was drawn to that piece, it was because there was probably this conceptual or idea path right. and this questioning of materials and this thinking beyond right. that I actually makes me want to draw attention to that artist um, more than, oh, cool, it's got some appendages, you know? <laughs> I mean, honestly. For sure, for um, sure. But like, yeah, and I'm, your... again, I'm not saying that that's not the. I'm not saying also that there can't be a photograph on acrylic that has those ideas and has that no. that I thoughts about material and everything. Yeah. No, for sure. It's just um, I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, I think you know if you're really looking to differentiate your work and to take it to another level, like exploring the actual medium is a great way to do that. To just you know, especially if you've already got a really good idea and you just want to elevate it even further, I, I feel like it's a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, I mean, it, when I when I taught the visual design classes, you know, whole lectures would be about, even if it is a, a two-dimensional print on a wall, I mean, you can play with scale, you can play with materials of framing, you can play with the way it's displayed on the wall. It doesn't have to be in a straight line. It can be an array. It can mm -hmm. be a grid. It can be small things down by the floor it can be you know so you know it can include objects on a table you know because i come from a, an installation background as well so uh it can have audio with your with your two-dimensional photographs on the wall so it, it's and it doesn't mean that it has to have all those other things but it is it's there's so many ways that you can 
you can explore even from even from the way it's displayed on the wall or the scale on the wall or, right. the, or the way they're shown together, diptychs and triptychs and on and on. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say one thing that I think photographers should play more with is aspect ratio because mm. if you've got something that's um, kind of more panoramic in nature, it can be a little bit more immersive mm -hmm. versus like a square one by one image can be more abstract feeling or um, it just like because it's square and you don't see the world square like it, it just it just changes the way you perceive the scene that's in the on the print. Yeah. And think about it, Matt, you know, ev everything we do with our digital cameras, you know, unless you have a medium format digital camera, which most of us don't, um, is 35 millimeter aspect ratio. Right, Two by three. And in, and in the days of film. That was not the case. I mean, I had a six by six Mamiya. I had a six, seven, right. you know, we had, you had six, nine, you had, there were so many different formats that was about your choice of aspect ratio and film size. And then there was film type, right? Mm -hmm. You chose your film type based on what you wanted your image to look like and the grain and, you know, the contrast and all of that. So we were already doing all of that. And a lot of those choices have been taken away from us or have fallen away, I should say, um, in the digital realm. And yeah, I think we're just here to say there's other ways we can bring those choices back in or that the, or that you can still consider them. Yeah, absolutely. But, well, yeah. so and, uh, and you're right. Aspect ratio is one of them for sure. Yeah. So back to alternative printing. Yeah. I last night just for fun, I created one of these broadcast channels on our Instagram for the podcast, uh, F Stop mm -hmm. Collaborate. And um, we got tons of questions for you. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, people are really excited. Fire away. One. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Pamela Sherlock has a question about selecting images for different processing. Um, mm. So she talks about cyanotype, turmeric, Kozo mm -hmm. and gold leaf. And mm -hmm. um, she found that some images worked well with cyanotype, some don't. So, like, what kind of thought process goes into figuring out what images should could work with different mediums it's an excellent question and in my workshop um that's usually after i show the, some of the methods like we do a different method every day that's the next dilemma is all my students are standing there going well which image should i use for that <laughs> and what are we doing tomorrow maybe i should save this image for that right and so it is and and when you're first starting out you just got to explore and experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Not worry too much about, is this going to look good in that? Is this going to look good in that? Just try it. And, and that's how you're going to learn. And that's really the answer to the question is with experience and time with the different materials, you'll start to know which images are going to look better with cyanotype and a contact print. And you're going to know which images are going to look better on a more translucent material like uh, you know, rice paper, um, you're good. That's going to be something you're going to learn with experience and visualizing and trying. Um, that's really not, and even with my students, I might say a little bit like maybe try this image with that. Or if you're going to do that on that material, let's jack up the contrast a little bit. I think we're going to lose the blacks, mm. you know, and that's where the advantage of having a teacher who's done it for a long time, I can help with that. But really, if you're out there learning it on your own, um, that's stuff you're just going to have to experiment with and learn over time which image looks great with which um, technique. And, and also then just giving it a try and seeing. And mm -hmm. there's going to be, that's the thing about alternative printing, there's going to be as many failures as there are successes. And so that's just got to be your mindset when you get into alternative printing. And, and then once you find a successful or like a way that's working for you, then you can probably, again, maybe not replicate, but you can get into a rhythm where you can start to produce something once you know that technique and those materials. Mm -hmm. So like in a cyanotype, uh, let's just use that as an example. Like what are some of the considerations that might make a cyanotype work well or not work well? Well, a sanotype is going to be a contact print generally, right? We coat the paper. And I'm talking about not just like the buy out of the box cyanotype paper, but where you get the chemicals and you coat the paper in the dark and expose and all that. Um, 
you know, the other thing, it, it can be a negative, but it can also be objects like a photogram, hmm. right? It doesn't have to be a picture. It can, you can create a picture out of physical objects on things like sanitapes, any UV print, Van Dyke Browns, um, lumens, any UV print can either be objects or it can be negatives or it can be both. Hmm. Um, so, so, you know, but most often photographers are using negatives. So it is a contact print. Um, you know, the, the contrast your, your negative is the contrast your the more tonal value your cyanotype is going to have, but there's no right or wrong. Meaning a contrast your cyanotype isn't necessarily more alluring than a limited tonal value flat ish. So there's, you know, again, there's really no, and the color profile and that, that are, are irrelevant with cyanotype because we're using black and white. Yeah. So it's more about the tonal value and the contrast. I mean, I hate to generalize, but I mean, I would say, especially if you're starting out with cyanotype, that really finite changes in tonal values um, might be a hard place to start because they're not going to translate as well on a cyanotype than on like a black and white paper. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe things, you know, with maybe... Yeah, maybe not fine, fine detail and fine tonal range are going to be a lot more challenging. Makes sense. Okay, got another question. Uh, my friend Jason Pettit, mm -hmm. he has a question more about print presentation. He thinks we're all kind of searching for something outside the matted black gallery frame. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He'd be interested to hear more about a stripped down approach to simple print presentation that's perhaps a little different. I mean, there's, again, you know, there are so many ways, but the fact that he says stripped down makes me think, I mean, anytime you eliminate the mat, that's already stripping it down. It becomes simpler. Mm -hmm. Then if you eliminate the frame, kind of like what you have in the back, right? That becomes simpler. And, and so you got to think about it. Oh, I'd say you got to think about it. What I learned in graduate school was that the chair of my thesis committee was the, uh, the head of my thesis committee was the chair of the sculpture department. I did mm. that on purpose. I, did, <laughs> I had no, I had no photography professors. Maybe I think I had to have one photography professor on my, on my committee. But what, what I learned from her is I remember I was showing work in a, a little exhibit and I was showing it full frame borderless, like your images in the back, but mine were on um, plexi. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had them up on the wall and she came in and she's the first thing she's, she, well, she said a couple things. And then she said, what are you going to do about your edges? And I was like, what do you mean my edges? What, what are you talking about? And like, t just look at the image. And she was like, <laughs> you haven't even considered your edges. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to finish them? Are you going to paint them? Are you going to, what are you going to do with them? Because I see them. And, and that was this moment for me where I was like, oh my God, as photographers, we would never think of that because we just assume everybody's gonna be consumed by the image mm -hmm. and they're not gonna look at anything else. And the, the sculptor came in and was like, immediately looked at the scale, the surface and my edges yeah. and commented on it. Just as much as she talked so about the image, <laughs> right? And so that literally changed everything for me. And so that's what I, I think about maybe to answer your friend's question is to think about everything even if it is a full frame borderless print like you have on the wall that's not all it is we can't just assume it's just about the image it's about the surface the material the edges the scale mm -hmm. the presentation on the wall the reflectivity right is it For shiny sure. is it not is it i mean it's so it's i would say it's about thinking about all those things Again, you don't have to overthink it, but considering it and not just neglecting it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Jeannie uh, Sumral Ahero, she, she said, I don't really know what alternative printmaking is, but I imagine some of it involves putting different substrates through the printer. If that's mm -hmm. the case, does she dedicate a separate inkjet printer for experimenting with different substrates? It seems like it could be an expensive mistake if something okay. goes wrong on my good printer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You have a printer that you use for your alternative printing. <laughs> and, and it, you know, it might void the warranty when you start shoving things through it. <laughs> and yes. Um, but I have to say, I've had 
the same printers that I use for a long time. Um, and they have lasted forever and ever, and they have never broken. You know, you do have to be careful. If the printer starts screaming at you, uh, you got to say, okay, I've had to say to my students before, this isn't going to work. Right. We're going to break the printer. Let's think of another way. Maybe let's do a transfer, right? Um, but yeah, you and, and, the, and you want to look for printers where you can adjust the platen mm -hmm. height. So um, you definitely, there are printers specifically made for thicker substrates. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's important. You want that because you, and you don't want the small, so desktop printers you don't want to use because a lot of them have what we call pizza rollers. Mm -hmm. And it's the little rolls uh, that help feed the paper through. And a lot of the subs, when we put substrates through the printer and alternative printing, they're not wet when we put them through, they're dry. We've, we have put wet materials on them and let them dry. But as you can imagine, it's going through the printer and the wet ink is coming down to hit it. You have a wet environment, damp right. environment. So if you have anything that hits that paper and tracks that paper, it's gonna, it's gonna get on your in the insides of your printer, your printer and it's gonna make tracks through your, your substrate. So you have to have a printer that doesn't have pizza wheels and that you can raise the, the head, the, the, the platen height, so that you can get things through safely. And you also want a printer that probably has a rear or front feed, not mm -hmm. just a top feed. Right. And that's usually any, that's probably gonna start with your like 17 inch wide professional photo printers. Um, you, can, you could start, that's probably gonna start in like a $1,200 range. And you could go up to way more extreme than that, of course, bigger and, you know, heavier and more expensive. And yeah, I still use my big wide format printer for regular prints. And it's the printer that I use in my workshops that we put all this junk through. <laughs> so I've been careful. You know, I haven't messed up my printer yet. Okay. So well, that's um, good. <laughs> not that you can't, it's not that you can't use it for both if you're careful about that. Yep. She wants also to know if you've had any printing disasters. Oh gosh, of course. Well, I mean, nothing's blown up or anything. <laughs> I did. I did set my. I did set our studio on fire in graduate school. Literally, the fire. Well, you did say fire, so. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. We and there were all the sorts of darkroom chemicals in there. I mean, I could have probably blown the building up. Um, <laughs> I had I had severe burns on my arm, Ooh. trying to get the thing that was on fire out of there so that the building wouldn't blow. And the fire company came and, and I ran away so that no one knew that it was me. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. So that's my, my biggest disaster, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, disaster is a big word for printing mistakes, but oh yeah, I've had things that we've had things in the workshop or I've had things on my own that I've coded and dried and, and cared for, for five days, getting ready to print. And then it's jammed or uh, it's messed up. So that's the thing too, is alternative printing. It takes patience and time and some things have to get prepared for a long time. And then, and then they get messed up mm, and so then you either start of, over a lot of failure. Yeah. Yeah. Or you do multiple, like I'll do three in case one gets messed up and then have the other two ready to go. But yeah, right. it's, you got to expect that. Has she figured out a way to print on vellum so that the ink doesn't bleed or is the bleed part of the creative process? No, the ink's not, the bleed is not because that is gonna, it's hard to then get an image on there and it is gonna mess up the inside of your printer because all that wet ink is getting on stuff. So yeah, there's a bunch of different um, products. Uh, that's what, in the beginning of the podcast, I mentioned InkAid is one of the companies, Golden, it, it's mostly, you know, Golden is like, right, the paint medium company. Um, I don't think Utrecht makes one. A lot of other companies have hopped on the bandwagon of making a substrate that's made. Uh, you, it's basically you coat materials that don't generally take inkjet. So any of our any of our inkjet paper, right, is is coated. It's a surface that is to accept inkjet mm -hmm. inks, right? Um, which is why you can't just take any kind of paper through and it's your image is going to stay. It either, you know, drips and does that or, you know, if you've ever tried something that's got a lot of saturation, you know, like a paper towel or rice paper, it just, you know, it's it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So there's these materials that you use that you coat the paper with and it it's chemically made to accept inkjet print. It has tooth 
Um, and it's made to not only accept inkjet prints, but maintain the contrast and color, the integrity of the image. So mm -hmm. InkAid, I use InkAid only because they were the first company who made this maybe 20 years ago now. And so I, I, I have stuck with them, but I've also used Goldens. Um, so there's all sorts of materials you can buy. Um, so they come in different, you know, gloss, medium, semi-gloss. They come in iridescent colors. Um, so it's basically... You gotta, coat, you gotta coat the substrate so it will accept the inkjet ink. So it's basically a chemical that you coat the yeah. substrate with and then... Yep. Okay, that makes sense. It's a, it's a wet, it's almost like a gel medium. It's a wet thing that you coat and you have to do a couple coats, let it dry. Let it dry. Um, but, but that alone, these products alone, and Inkade has the most uh, variety, which is also why I use them. But again, these alone have all their different characteristics as far as, like I said, sheen and, and also color. You know, oh, they have wow. a whole set of iridescent different colors that add a little bit of an iridescent color to your paper or a little bit of like, iridescence and shine so that's a whole other way to to explore different ways even with the substrate i mean this chemical yeah wow okay and i will say matt i don't mean to interrupt but just so everybody knows ink aid does have little sample sets that you can buy oh cool so you buy a sample set so you can because otherwise you're going to buy one big expensive thing and you know you might not know if you like it so i would say start with their sample sets perfect yeah. all right uh, <laughs> what's the weirdest substrate that you've put through a printer? Put through a printer. I didn't put it through a printer, but I had one of my students who wanted to print on her, um, her Converse sneaker. Oh, okay. Yeah. We did. That was a transfer. We didn't put it through the printer. Um, I have done like paper towels. Um, you know, through the printer isn't as wild because it has to be so thin and malleable um but right. getting images onto um i mean in graduate school i was taking giant rolls of vellum laying them out on big you know fold out tables i was taking gallons of self-leveling gel and pouring them on and letting that level out um and then i was and i had to be on the table sort of trying to get the surface smooth um and then I was transferring images onto that and then peeling that medium off the vellum. Mm. Um, so, and then I got these sort of transparent gel skins. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I was, and then I'd hang them like off the wall. So the, so they'd be, yeah. they'd move yeah. and light would come through them. Oh, and wow. That sounds awesome. That was, <laughs> yeah. I spent about a year doing that kind of stuff and that was, that was super fun. Yeah, I bet. And also like probably really fragile. You know, that's why I was using coats and coats of self-leveling gel on the table is I got those things to be pretty thick. Got so it. they, okay. they weren't fragile. They were, they were, they were pretty meaty. So no, yeah. so no food items like a burrito or taco shell nope. or anything like that? <laughs> no, that's, I think that's where I draw the limit of maybe messing <laughs> up my printer, my, my $1,500 printer. I'd fear if I put food through there. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Okay. Yeah. One last question uh, from Trevor uh, Valinga. How can Eileen, who appears to be a highly creative individual, always exploring new directions on her website, share some tips for those stuck in a creative rut looking to push themselves further? So I have a lot of thoughts about that. And my first thing is, if you're in a creative rut, don't worry about pushing yourself further, mm -hmm. right? Meaning you're either in a good place and you can push yourself further or you're in a rut and you just got to figure out how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So to me, there are two, two different things. Yeah. Um, if you're in a rut though, let's go with that. I have been there a million times and some of my ruts have lasted concerningly long. Yeah. Um, what I would say is you have to just know that it is a part of everyone's creative process that you are going to get stuck. You're going to have self doubt. You are not going to want to do it. You are going to give up. Um, there's a great quote that one of my favorite books is called Art and Fear. And, um, and there's a great quote from it that says, quitting only happens once to an artist. Artists stop and start all the time. Quitting only happens once, right? Mm. So the point is, you're not quitting if you stop and you take a break or you can't get started again. As long as you start again, you haven't quit. 
Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, I have gone through such dry spells. What I would suggest is, first of all, be easy on yourself and don't beat yourself up for it and don't force something if you just, because I, I see those, those down moments as a time to take, take things in, maybe contemplate a little bit, take a break, step back. And you're always accepting, you know, creative juices from the universe. You're always somehow manifesting that, whether you're listening to music or going to a show or, you know, I don't know, redecorating your house or working on your car or or whatever it may be. Right. I mean, there's so many ways that we can be creative in our lives and it's not always making an art object. So I think you got to be easy on yourself and, you know, maybe you're reading some great books and getting into an author, whatever it may be. Maybe you're learning to cook a new type of food. Mm -hmm. Um, All that stuff matters and it all feeds our creativity. And it also, if you let it all starts to accumulate for when we are ready to make the work, it influences us. It's like you said, it becomes a part of who you are. It's knowing yourself. And also going with those things that you love to do and that are exciting to you. So, you know, be gentle on yourself. I mean, I think if the rut starts to feel concerning, um, there's two approaches. You can sort of baby step and like make yourself go look at art, make yourself maybe read about art, Um, make yourself make something, even if it's not the end all be all. Uh, Even if it's your, maybe you do a little woodworking or you do a little knitting or, or cooking, anything, but make something. And then the other approach, if it really starts to get crazy and concerning is, uh, you know, you you just, you just have to make, you have to pick up the camera or you have to pick up the pencil and, and you just have to make a motion with it. Mm -hmm. You just got to do something with it. You know, it's like. Twyla Tharp says, you know, I get my best ideas. She's a choreographer. I get my best ideas when my body is in motion, not when I'm sitting still, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like that writer, like when they make the, the, the mark on the paper is, is when things happen. So if you're not making any marks or making any moves, um, there's less chance that something's going to happen. Yeah. So it's sort of a balance of being gentle on yourself, but then having that discipline of like, I just got to do something and it's not important what I do and it might totally suck and it might come to nothing, but I just got to make that mark. I was going to suggest just spending time alone on a hike or something like that without the camera. You know, yep. I actually just did a 35 day hike. I did 520 awesome. miles Colorado trail Awesome. And um, my, I have, I had too many ideas. It was, I was like, <laughs> I have to keep hiking. Like, if I just keep thinking and writing stuff down, I'll never get anywhere. Yep. But, yep. you know, spending time by yourself, like, there's just gonna be stuff that hits you, especially when yep. you're just focused on survival, daily survival. Yeah. So, like, backpacking is great for like cleaning out a creative rut, I think, because right, your attention gets pulled into like the basics. And then yep. it kind of frees you up to have space for the other stuff to kind of just come to you. So, yeah. And I will say, Matt, in my in the magazine Butterflies and Anvils, every single artist, one of the questions I would ask is, when, what are you doing when ideas come to you? And almost every single artist was doing some sort of solitary thing, whether it yeah. was in the shower, on a walk, you know, whatever it was. But it was that time alone to just let your brain wander. Yep. Yep. yep, absolutely. Okay, I got a couple more questions for you. Um, I, and I think I, I have a whole series of questions I wanted to ask you about abstract photography, but I think we can mm-hmm. save that for our bonus episode. Tell us a little bit about your handmade photo workshops and how can people learn more about uh, getting involved into the things that you're teaching? Yeah, so, you know, I was doing them probably, I think, maybe twice a year before the pandemic hit. And I was going to different cities around the country to do them. Mm. Um, (laughs) And which was interesting because I had to like pack up a giant truck full of materials. Um, So they were all within driving distance of Missoula. You know, I did like Washington state and and anywhere, but um, once the pandemic hit, those stopped and I have just resumed um, doing the workshops again. I had my first one, October, 21st, 2nd, and 23rd here in Missoula. Um, 
And they used to be week longs, but now I'm doing three days. Um, they're always listed on my website and that's how you can find out about them. And that's how you can register. Um, I keep them small because it's hands on and, um, the format is usually, you know, I, I introduce materials. I usually show a method. We talk about it. I, um, show you how to do it. And then that day, that's the method we dive into and everybody mm. just starts mm -hmm. going. And it's really awesome. I find it a great way to learn because they see it done. They try it themselves. And rather than being home and trying to learn all this yourself and hitting a wall and not not knowing how to problem solve or not knowing what just went wrong, you know, I'm there. So if they have a problem, oh, well, this is the problem. Right. Oh, well, no, you need to coat that thicker. You need to let that dry more, mm -hmm. um, whatever it may be. Um, so it's this real quick way of learning because they're not having to trudge through a million mistakes and then getting maybe discouraged and frustrated and not doing the thing. Right. So, so that's the overall, you know, again, I list them on my website. I have thought about traveling again to do them. Um, it's just with my work world right now, it makes more sense to do them in Missoula. So I hope to resume a spring and a fall one. And what I did in the past was one would be de dedicated more to transfers and ink aid and that kind of thing. And the other ones were more dedicated to UV stuff like cyanotypes and, and chemograms and lumens. And, mm. um, and so that's kind of the format. I hope that, you know, I can continue to do those. Um, well, I think this episode will come out after your next one, but yep. um, I think hopefully you'll have some people that'll be interested in learning more about that. Yeah. So do you have oh, like a I know newsletter what else. or something people can sign up for? I d uh, no, but I, I do an email blast. So yeah, if you, okay. you get in touch with me, I'll put you on the email list. Um, the other thing I was going to say about that, Matt, is I've had a lot of people ask if I would do online courses mm. for this. Mm -hmm. And I have seriously thought about it um, or, you know, doing some sort of video presentation. Right. Um, I could do that. I mean, I'm a videographer. I could film that and make it happen. I just have a really hard time imagining someone watching me do it, doing it at home by themselves. And like I said, not having that closed looped feedback from me. Um, I could do it, but it's, it's going to be a longer learning process. It's going to be more frustrating learning process. So my point is people are going to always ask that. I am considering it. It's just there's something about that we're together hands on learning it's a hands-on process, so I like to teach right. it hands-on. So right. that makes sense. It's on my radar, but yeah. So it my point is, sense. get on a plane and come to Missoula, and I'll teach you how to do alternative printing. <laughs> and the best time to be in Missoula is fall, I bet. Fall is amazing. Yeah. Fall's amazing. Yep. I love it. All right. Last question. Who do you recommend for the podcast? Who are some artists or photographers that we should know more about? Oh, man, I think I mentioned Forrest Woodward. Um, I met him when he was just a youngin. He worked for RMSP. Um, he's now a, a hugely successful, wildly create, creative, uh, you know, outdoor photographer, um, stock photographer, movie maker, documentary. He's He does it all, and he's a, just a quality human and... Um, always amazes me at the way he continues to push his creativity. Um, I think I mentioned Gabriel Biderman, who mm -hmm. works for B&H, who does uh, night photography. Uh, he's another person where I am constantly, I've known him a long time, constantly impressed with his, his energy, his, his devotion to his craft, honestly. Yeah. He doesn't seem to ever get tired or I, maybe he has ruts. I don't see it. <laughs> Two people you haven't mentioned yet that you had listed uh, for me. One was Tim Cooper. Tim Cooper. Um, which I think he works for National Parks at Night as well, doesn't he? He does. He's partner with Gabe and a couple other guys, a dear friend. Um, you know, the thing about Tim Cooper is you could, he was also trained in the darkroom. You know, mm -hmm. he started with 8x10. Coop, the reason I mention him is because it would be such an inter interesting conversation uh, because his in-depth knowledge of the technical side of photography over 25 years is is mind-boggling like meaning he knew film and cameras and the dark room so well and he knows digital cameras and photoshop and lightroom just as well yeah um and so yeah he's and he's a very interesting photographer 
Um, and then yep, you, so. and then you had also mentioned uh, Doug Johnson. Oh, Doug Johnson is another colleague from RMSP. And what I love about Doug is Doug reminds me a little bit of Edward Weston in the respect that like <clears throat> Doug can photograph any subject matter. He's not just a landscape photographer. I interviewed him in my magazine and Doug does great abstract photography. He does great landscape photography. He does great people photography. He does great documentary photography. Like he's one of those guys who can actually just do it all. And, and he is just the most positive, energetic, contagious uh, love of photography. Uh, you can't be around him and not get excited about photography. And all these guys, all these guys are, that I've mentioned are great, edu they're all educators. So well, meaning he, you can, he's yeah, never, find he's never, he's never met my wife. Oh, meaning? Like, oh, you want to talk about photography again? Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. The spouses and the partners, you know, sometimes get a little tired of our obsessiveness. Exactly. That's what, that's what we're always said. I've made the mistake before, but I used to always say I'm never going to date a photographer because I need a break. Right. <laughs> I, I don't want to be over dinner talking about photography. I want to talk about something else. Right. Let's talk about movies or something. Yeah. Anything exactly. other than. Right. <laughs> Right, right. Well, Eileen, this has been super fun. And um, I think people got a lot out of this. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, Matt. It was really fun. Absolutely. Well, thank you to Eileen for joining me for such a fun conversation. I learned a ton and I hope that our listeners did too. I would love to hear from our listeners about your experiences doing alternative printing or your thoughts on the episode in general. The best way to join in on that conversation is to join us for free on Patreon. Each week I will be creating a thread for the episode on Patreon for listeners to chime in on. To get started, just go over to patreon.com forward slash fstop and listen to create your free account or you can visit the link in the show notes. I look forward to engaging with all of you over on Patreon. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.